Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the study session for meteorology. Today we're going to be trying something a little bit different. I've had an idea. What I'm going to do is I'm going to answer some questions on the question bank. I'm going to show you it in full. Any mistakes that I make, I'll then note down. We'll go back to those questions, review our answers, gain a bit more knowledge, and then hopefully use that knowledge in the upcoming live stream exam um, that I will be doing in the future. Hello and welcome to the study session that we're going to be doing for meteorology. Um, just going to answer some questions, run through them, show you how I would use the question bank to study basically because it's a very useful tool and there's a few different versions out there. I've used the Bristol Ground School one in the past but today we're going to be using uh, Airhead ATPL which is quite a new question bank. Uh, it's still in the development stages. It's well, I think it's just out of beta. Um, so it's got a lot of new features and even yesterday, I think more features were added. So it's in development, which is good news. Um, and here's my clicker there. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna, they gave me access to it for free and um, just so I could check it out and give some honest feedback, which I have done and they've implemented some of those changes. Um, so yeah, this is the home screen, you know, you've got your practice questions, I've had a look obviously, uh, untimed times exam, EASA, from a specific date, um, should you want it, you've got this section which is the practice section, so you can start a test, I've had a little um, go at some, gotten a couple questions in just to check the features of various tests, you can search for specific things, um, say you were really struggling with questions on um, inversions or something like that. You could search inversions and all the questions with inversions in the title would come up. You can choose topics of subjects, quality, five star exams, the last questions, that's like the last ones that were added to the bank, um, questions you've never seen, you know, various options. And then you've got the section down here, which gives you just an overview of the exams and you can click on meteorology and go start time, start on time. So that's a quick run over of the features uh, before you sign up to them. Uh, get a wee idea. So we're going to go to practice because we're practicing. We'll start a test. We'll go meteorology. We'll go all topics. Obviously you could, if you had trouble er uh, problem areas, you could study specifically, but we're just going to see what we're doing. Um, we can, questions I've never seen before. Uh, there's 8,086 questions. Let's not do 8,086. Let's just do 30. Let's imagine we've only got a little bit of time, maybe an hour in the afternoon or something like that. Um, to crack out some uh, some study. So yeah, after I provide my answers, I want the answers. Uh, after I provide my answers, I want to know if I'm right or not, and we will not show a countdown time, we'll take our time. So let's start practicing. Let's see what we've got. Oh, and I've also got um, a little screen here, with some rough notes, I managed to hook my phone up. So you can see a bit of notes that'll come off and on as you write throughout the session and most importantly for me I'm going to get some music going in the background because that's how I would study in real life. Um, cool, so this is what the question looks like. You can see it's got a rating up here. Users have given it ratings to see how good a question it is. This is the website that it actually comes from, Aviation Exam. Um, all the information from where it comes from. Um, this is a little question timer. Uh, question type, question finder, and then, yeah, the question itself, you've got this feature down here, which is similar questions. You've got this, which allows you to add it to your own little collection of questions. So you've got problem questions. Uh, you can add little private notes. You can mark it as, as seen in the exam, oh, or unmark it. Um, and then you can see comments, which I quite like, actually. I think this is quite a good feature that you don't get in a lot of other question banks. It just means you've got um, yeah, a bit of community. Um, so if you're not sure, check what could not be the right answer. Wesley's between 30 and 60. So obviously this is going to give us a bit of a clue if we read them before. But if we get them wrong, for example, that's going to be quite useful. We can use other people's knowledge and then go back and look at our notes, see if anything's, uh, see if there's any reason for us getting the question wrong, really. So we'll click that off for now. So where are the westerlies to be expected? So if we're thinking of the westerlies, 
we're thinking of, uh, say, we've got the, the Earth itself, the equator, we've got the trade winds here, and then the westerlies up there and down there. So it's going to be mid latitudes, uh, probably between 10 and 30 degrees north or south, that's the trade winds. The mid latitudes, that makes sense, between 65 degrees and 80 degrees north or south, that's a bit too far north in the subtropical high pressure belt. So no, in the mid latitudes. See if we can start off well. So yeah, obviously lights up green, that's us all correct. Question two, so you can see it's obviously got its rating and everything, exactly the same format. Just one comment, but very similar questions. So LSAS, uh, where is that? Can't remember, Switzerland somewhere, obviously. Uh, so it's got Sigmet, number two, valid, on the 3rd at 7 a.m. until the 3rd at 11 a.m. for Zurich. So LSAS is the FIR region, LSZH is Zurich Airport itself. So Switzerland FIR, moderate to severe, uh, clear air turbulence forecast north of Alps between flight level 260 and 380. Uh, strength intensifying? Yes. Yeah, I think that's what that means. Okay, so which of the following statements is an appropriate interpretation of Sigma? I didn't even read that question. So the zone of moderate to severe turbulence moving towards the area north of the Alps, intensity increasing, pilots advised to cross this area above flight level 260. You wouldn't cross it at 260 because that's where the turbulence is. Moderate to severe clear air turbulence, yes, of constant intensity to be expected north of the Alps. Severe turbulence observed below flight level 260, no. North of the Alps, pilot advised to cross this area above flight level 380, no. Moderate to severe clear air turbulence to be expected north of the Alps, intensity increasing, danger zone between flight level two. So probably question f uh, answer four is the most appropriate. Let's submit that. So correct. Let's see what the comment says. Seen in Paris, DGAC today, three marks. That must be an exam that he did. Um, this guy. Oh well. Cool. Uh, which of the following statements about lightning and lightning strikes is correct? Uh, compasses and electronics are always affected. You can't say that with certainty. The aircraft is temporarily part of the lightning trajectory. Lightning strikes always cause heavy damage. Spherical lightning often penetrate into aircraft. The aircraft is temporarily part of the lightning trajectory. I suppose that would make sense because it hits on its way to ground. Yeah, there you go. Check the correctness of the following statements. So this is a correct and incorrect one. So with these, because it's quite confusing in the wording sometimes, just write down statement one, statement two. Um, so outside clouds, no severe airframe icing can occur. That's not necessarily true because you could be outside the cloud but uh, in precipitation, in heavy rain, in uh, yeah, in rain, or um, freezing rain, freezing fog, that kind of thing, or snow even, obviously. Um, hoar frost consists of ice crystals formed on a surface by sublimation. That is correct. That's uh, the moisture in the air directly freezing onto the surface of the aircraft. So I'm gonna go incorrect, correct, so one is not correct, two is correct. That's what I think it is. Question five, an aircraft is approaching a cold front from the warm air mass side at flight level 270 and experiencing moderate to severe turbulence. A jet stream is forecast to be at flight level 310. The shortest way to get out of this turbulence is an aircraft is approaching a cold front from the warm air mass side at flight level 270 and experiencing moderate to severe turbulence. The jet stream is forecast to be level 310. Okay, let's draw this out. So let's draw it. Aircraft, so cold front from the warm air mass. So it's a cold front coming in, something like that. And he's approaching from this way at flight level 270. Uh, 
a jet stream is forecast to be at 310. So the uh, jet stream, this is the warm, this is the cold, it's going to be on the high to low pulled around to the right. So high to low pulled around to the right, it's going to be like into the page. Um, so we could, if we turn right, we'll turn into the jet stream. Hmm. Sorts way to get out is probably descending because then you're going to be further away from the jet stream. Let's have a, a pop at descending, see what happens. Yeah, because if you climb, you're going to climb into 310 and climb into the uh, turbulence. If you turn right, you're just going to fly along with it. Climb it, yeah, maintaining 270, you're going to be on the very edge of that sort of clear air turbulence zone. So we descend, get uh, clear. Question six, which one of the following local winds is a phone wind? So descending, dry, uh, generally a bit warm. So Bora, that comes over the uh, mountains in the Balkan regions and descends down into the Mediterranean, quite quite dry. Harmattan is sort of the version of the monsoon in sub-Saharan Africa. You've got the Chinook, which I can't actually remember what the Chinook is. Is the Chinook the one that blows over the Rockies in America. I can't remember, but let's, there you go, that's a study point. That's how I would think about studying. I'd need to obviously go and look away and see what the Chinook wind is, because I can't remember. Uh, and the Sirocco is uh, up through the desert um, into Europe, up through the Sahara Desert into Europe, dry, sandy. So, oh, that's annoying that I don't know what the Chinook was, and the Bora. So the Bora, I'm going to go with the Bora, or it could be the Chinook actually, if, if that's the one that I'm thinking, then that would blow over the Rockies, and that's why there is a desert to the left of the Rockies, essentially, because it's a very dry, so I'm going to go Chinook actually. Okay, so let's see what the comments say on this, because it's actually... Anyone knows why Bora is not a phone wind, and he, because it's a cold wind rather than a hot wind, I suppose, yeah. Um, Chinook is the Rocky Mountains one, yeah, so okay. Yeah, same as the phone effect in Europe. Okay, cool, so. Was unsure, took a, took a guess. Uh, what are the Willy Willies? Uh, so, Willy Willies is just like the most Australian sounding thing I've ever heard in my life. So it's a special sandstorm, I think it's their version of tropical revolving storms. Comments on this will be pretty decent, surely. Oh, look, there's a Willy Willy coming, mate. <laughs> if it's got a weird name, it's got to be from Down Under. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. So there you go. See, like, that's that's what I quite like about this. As you can see, you, you know there's a question like that. You know there's going to be a few comments of people thinking it's quite funny. Um, so during warm anticyclonic conditions, so high pressure conditions during the summer months in Europe, which of the following can be expected. So anticyclonic high pressure. So we can expect clear skies, moderate to poor visibility because all the smog and stuff is being kept down, steady rain um, in the summer, probably not because it's going to be nice and clear weather, steady rain, moderate to poor visibility. Say clear skies, moderate to poor visibility, that's most likely. In temperature latitudes, what weather conditions may be expected over land during the summer in the centre of a stationary high pressure zone in temperate latitudes? So temperate latitudes, uh, Europe again, I suppose, a good way to think of it. What weather conditions may be expected over land in the centre of stationary high pressure zone? So this is almost exactly the same questions we just had. Okay, we'll take it. Um, calm winds, haze during summer, yeah, nice. Which climatic zone, uh, climatic t zone type is it to be expected between 10 degrees north and 10 degrees south? So climatology, um, we're thinking 10 degrees north, 10 degrees south, equatorial. Um, so it's not gonna be uh, arid, because that's subtropical. 
tropical rain climate. Yeah, you get a lot of thunderstorms. Tropical transitional. So there's a, a few different names here floating about, which is quite confusing with climatology. There's loads of names that fly around for it. But you can make uh, educated guess. So tropical transitional is most likely going to be like the savanna sort of areas. Warm, temperate rain climate. So uh, it's in the temperate zone, obviously, because it's got temperate in the name. Tropical rain, I'd say tropical rain. Yeah, so let's look at the comments on this. It was an exam. Tropical transition climate is 10 to 20, 0 to 10 equatorial. Yeah, so there you go. Um, seeing why that's not the answer there. A few comments on that. Cool, so the transition from southwest to northeast monsoon in India occurs in, so southwest to northeast. So that's gonna be, let's just get my head around this correctly. So let's do a very rough drawing of India, that's India. <laughs> and in the summer, it gets nice and hot here, um, which means that there is a flow of air into it because it's a sea breeze, essentially. Hot air rises, it's replaced and spreads out, um, yeah, and it heats more than the sea. So that would be in the summer, which is the northeast monsoon. Um, yeah. And when does the transition from the southwest? So in the winter, it's this way. So it's northern hemisphere. When does it transfer from northwest? It's going to be at the summer. The transition. It's going to be February to April? No. September to November. Oh, people are not happy about this question. Oh, uh, that's quite a good way, actually. There you go. Monsoon. Mons monsoon, monsoon. September, October, November. That's quite cool, actually. I like that. Um, keyword transition. I prefer a sweaty, wet summer, never dry winter. So summer to winter. Keep the blue side up and happy landings. Keep the blue side up. Monsoon, yeah, I've never actually, another person using that, so soon, September, October, November. There you go, that's a good one. Um, cool. Right, what's the direction of the wind in the winter monsoon in India? So we've just done this, so this is going to be uh, north east. Obviously, we've just had that question before, which gives us a massive clue on this. You do get that sometimes in the exams. You get questions that have answers to other questions in them, which is quite good. Um, which of the following conditions is most likely to cause airframe icing? So, freezing rain is always a good one. GR is hail. Think about like grains. Uh, showers of snow. And PL, what's PL? Hmm. Oh, there you go. There's a revision point. Let's uh, find out what PL means. Let's have a look on up on my phone just now. Okay, so after a quick search on a Metar decoder, PL is pellets of ice. Um, very simply. Okay, so freezing rain. Freezing rain is the, possibly the worst thing for icing. Uh, what degree of aircraft icing is determined by the following ICAO description? Conditions in which immediate changes of heading and or altitude is considered essential. Okay, so if it's light, it's not going to be essential, is it? Moderate, it's not going to be essential either. Violent might be probably severe, I would say. I can't, there's going to be some official description somewhere. Yeah. Uh, what is true for the water vapour distribution in the layer between the surface and the 500 hectopascal precious surface in the trade wind belt? Okay, so there are quite a few questions which feature 
talking about the 500 hectopascal pressure layer or other sorts of layers. Um, and something to note with that is normally we use our um, standard temperature and pressure lapse rates and start at 1013, 2 hectopascals uh, per thousand feet. Is that right? God, I'm in a mind like. No, two degrees per thousand feet in terms of temperature and pressure is one hectopascal for every 27 or every 30 feet. So that's only in the standard atmosphere. So when we're talking about 500 hectopascals, in reality what happens is the layers of pressure are sort of compressed. So you get loads and loads of particles here and then fewer and fewer and fewer. So the pressure distribution isn't equal. You get your 1013 and then instead of every set distance going down by a certain amount, you get more um, higher pressure further down and the gaps are smaller, if that makes any sense at all. Basically, a good thing to remember is these levels. So we've got flight level five zero, flight level 100, flight level 180, flight level 300, and flight level 390. And then you've got equivalent pressures for all of them. So the best one to start with, I think, is 50 is 850, and that's hectopascals. And you've got 100 is 700, 180 is 500, You've got 300 is 300, that's quite an easy one to remember, and 390 is 200. So you've got a few, you know, that's quite an easy one to remember. 850 with the 50 and 700 and 100 are sort of, you know, they're both fairly similar uh, shapes at the start. You've got like the one and the seven. Just go into the exam, write that down, because this question will come up in some version or another um, at some point, I reckon. Um, so yeah, there, there's a bit of an unequal distribution in the real atmosphere. In the standard atmosphere, you use those standard lapse rates and stuff like that, but in the real, um, real atmosphere, there's a distribution which is uneven. So let's look at uh, this question, right, now that I've explained that little thing. Um, right, so what's true for water vapor distribution in a layer between the surface and the 500 hectopascals? So we know from our thing that 500 hectopascals 180, um, so flight level 180. So the lower part in the trade wind belt. The trade wind belt is sort of in the region of the, um, it's between the high and the low, so it's gonna be sort of the savanna region. So the whole layer, the lower part is relatively moist, the upper part is relatively dry. The lower part is relatively dry and the upper part is relatively moist. The whole layer is relatively moist, the whole layer is relatively dry. And the lower part is relatively moist because it's over the sea. What's the comment saying on that? Yeah, that's why I'm thinking the same as that bar. Um, low moist, high dry. Yeah, okay. Weird question. It's an Elmo's fire near thunderstorms can be described, but this is a really cool effect. This, if you've not had a Google of what this is, I had this a couple of weeks ago on a flight down to Turkey. It's a really cool looking thing. Um, but it probably means you're a bit too close to the thunderstorm. You want to be a bit further away. Um, so St. Elmo's fire near the thunderstorm can be described as lightning in the horizontal plane in a cumulonimbus cloud hitting the wing tip. No, an electric discharge from the aircraft caused by static buildup on the air airframe. The electric charge of the aircraft caused by air parcels over the wings and windscreen. Lightning from the top of a mature cumulonimbus cloud hitting the fuselage. So it's wind. The only thing I'm thinking of is windscreen because it's an effect that you see on the windscreen. An electric discharge from the aircraft caused by electric charge from the aircraft caused by air parcels. Copy that one. No. An electric discharge. I suppose yeah. I suppose it is a discharge of the aircraft caused by static buildup. Um, keyword discharge, yeah. OK, 
keyword is discharge. Cool. Uh, what hazard can obscure a cockpit window in flight? What hazard can obscure? I mean, all of these could, in theory, if they get bad enough. Clear ice, hoarfrost, unlikely, um, hail, uh, drizzle. Hail would probably bounce off. Drizzle. Let's go hail. Clear ice. I mean, windscreens are heated most of the time. Yeah. It's not a very good question, that. That's uh, Can I give it a rating? No. <laughs> That'd be good. Okay, cool. The Southwest monsoon starts in the month of, so we can use that handy tool that I've literally just learned. So if we delete all these pressure levels, and then we've got um, the monsoon. I like this one. So it's September, October, November. Starts in the month of September in Pakistan to reach Southern India in November. Yeah, let's go for that. What? What? I thought it was monsoon. Southwest June in Southern India to reach Pakistan in July. Sweat in summer southwest, yeah, okay. Ah, I got too bogged down on my own learnings. Oh well, cool. Uh, the pressure system indicated in a vertical cross section by pressure surfaces at lower heights, bolting upwards and pressure surface at great heights bolting downwards is. Now that is a weird question. Okay. So let's go and draw this out. Pressure system indicated in a vertical cross section by pressure surfaces at lower levels bulging upwards. So let's go pressure level of 1000 bulging upwards and a pressure surface at great heights, greater heights bulging downwards is a. So it's going to be warm at the surface but low pressure. Does that make sense? Why would it bulge up? If it's in here, that's gonna be a much higher pressure. So that's gonna be a high pressure, high surface pressure. So it's a high pressure area. And why would this dip? This would dip because everything's compressing, because it's cold. So it'd be a cold, high pressure area. So that, yeah, so you can kind of work that out. So I'm looking at the actual pressure here. If this is 1,000, this is gonna be larger than 1,000 here. So that's gonna be high pressure because it's all about surface pressure. And then at altitude, if it's cold, everything shrinks together, everything compresses down. So that's why it's cold up at altitude. Cool. Uh, rime ice forms through the freezing onto aircraft surfaces of, so rime ice, is sort of small stuff. So small, super clued, block droplets. Yes. In which pressure system will true altitude decrease at all altitudes? In which pressure system will true altitude decrease at all altitudes as you're approaching the center of the pressure? Oof. All right, okay, so. This is what we just looked at as well. This is definitely worth drawing out. Okay, so in which pressure system will the true altitude decrease at all altitudes you, as you are approaching the center of the pressure? So we want something that looks along the lines of this. So it's gonna be, you're flying along with your pressure setting of 800 hectopascals or at the pressure level of 800 hectopascals. You're flying along, you come down, so your true altitude is decreasing. And the same thing lower down, you want to fly along and yeah, it comes down. So it's gonna be a double dip sort of thing like this. So say we're at the surface here. This is our surface. That's gonna be low pressure because we're gonna be above the line, which is low pressure there. 
so it's uh, low. It's also going to be cold because that's all compressed out. So in a cold low. Yeah, there we go. Which of the following statements is correct? Airframe icing can occur in clear air. Not really. Haze is a reduction of visibility due to the presence of water vapor. Yeah. Mounted waves are always accompanied by rotor clouds, always being the keyword. It's not necessarily. Above the tropopause, no turbulence occurs. So haze is a reduction of visibility due to, it's like the stage before fog, haze. What? Airframe icing. Haze is a reduction of visibility due to the presence of water vapor. That's definitely what that is. Airframe icing can occur in clear air. Hmm, that's a weird question. No comments on it either. Airframe icing can occur. I suppose it can. Yeah, I suppose you've got um, hoarfrost, water vapor sublimating directly onto the surface. Yeah, okay. But haze is definitely a reduction of. Oh, no. Haze is a reduction in visibility due to the presence of, like, smog and smoke and stuff like that. It's mist, which is a reduction of visibility due to the presence of water vapor. Right, okay, so read the question. RTFQ, read the bloody question, um, as one of my teachers told me in flight school. What is ex the expected visibility in a heavy dust storm? Ooh, heavy dust storm, you know, really, really bad. Yeah. There you go. Which statement is true for hurricanes? Um, from the Earth's surface up to the tropopause, the core is warmer than its surroundings. The greatest frequency of occurrence is in winter, not really. The diameter is 50 to 500 meters. They intensify rapidly after landfall. So they usually uh, decrease in intensity after landfall. So that's not correct. Maybe this is miles. It's not going to be meters, is it? The greatest frequency of occurrence is in winter. That's not right. From the Earth's surface up to the tropopause, the core is warmer than its surroundings. Um, I don't think so. So I'm going to say that the diameter is 50 to 500. I'm assuming that's miles. No, the Earth's surface up to the drop was the core is warmer than its surroundings. Why is that then? Okay, that's worth going away and looking at. Not sure why that is the case. Uh, so I'll take a note of that. Go and look ahead to some uh, stuff on hurricanes and tropical revolving storms. Uh, hoar frost forms as a result of freezing rain striking aircraft. No, that's going to be... Uh, clear ice or rime ice. Water vapor turning directly into ice crystals on the aircraft surface. That sounds right. Small, super cool droplets striking the aircraft. That'd be rime droplets forming on the aircraft and then freezing. That'd be like freezing rain or something. So water vapor turning directly into ice crystals on the aircraft surface. Bosh. Refer to this image. The cloud type most applicable to square 1E is... So 1E. So it's at the start of a warm front. So this is going to be like cirrus clouds, high altitude, um, that kind of thing. So is there an option for cirrus? CS is cirrus. Yes. There you go. Which thunderstorms move forward the fastest? Uh, frontal orographic thermal. Why am I doing this in reverse? Frontal orographic thermal and thunderstorms formed by lifting processes. Which move forward the fastest? Um, good question. Frontal, probably, because fronts move quite fast. Yeah. Because the orographic kind of just stay in situ because um, they're rising over a mountain, for instance. Thunderstorm form a lifting process. Again, they form sort of in situ thermal. If there's a hot area, it'll form over the hot area, whereas frontal is actually moving. So these would probably, these will move a bit, but the frontal is the one that's most associated with moving. Which of the following statements is correct concerning rotors below the crest of a mountain wave? Um, the wind direction at the lower side of the rotors is opposite to the prevailing wind direction. So the rotors are kind of the mountain wave comes along like this and you get the rotors underneath doing this basically 
uh, spinning like a rotor. So the wind direction to the lower side of the rotor is opposite. That's kind of true. The axis of these rotors is vertical. No, it's horizontal. It's spinning. Um, yeah, like a normal wheel in a car. Sort of that axis is horizontal and the wheels spin around it. The wind direction at the top of the rotors is opposite to the railing wind direction. No, that would be the same. The rotors are always visible by the presence of. So always is, is not a very good word to hear in an exam. Um, or it is a good word because always implies like every single situation, especially in meteorology. It's such a weird sort of science that nothing's always, you know, there's always exceptions, I suppose you could think of it, but always is uh, quite a good word to see or a bad word to see, whatever you think of it as. So the wind direction at the lower side of the rotors is opposite the prevailing wind direction because it's rolling over. That sounds about right. Yeah. Cool. Which is true of the temperature at the tropopause? Uh, okay, so it is higher in equatorial regions than in polar regions. There is no significant variations. Change of latitude, higher in polar regions, highest in mid latitudes. So, what we can think of this as is you've got the Earth and then you've got the tropopause. In the uh, equatorial regions, it bulges out a bit more because it's hotter and it spreads out. So you could say that the temperature at the tropopause in the equatorial regions is going to be a bit lower, I think, because um, it's going to be higher up, essentially. So um, what did I just say? I completely forgot what I just said. Yeah, it's going to be lower at the equatorial regions. Does that make sense? It's higher in equatorial regions. It's higher in polar regions. The temperature is going to be higher in the polar regions. Yes, because it's occurring lower down, so the temperature lapse rate has a lot less time to affect it. Which of the following statements best describes the theoretical development of the geostrophic wind in the northern hemisphere? Okay, so geostrophic wind, high to low, pulled round until it eventually lines up. Um, cool. So as the air starts to move and is accelerated by the pressure gradient force, it is increasingly deflected to the right by the Coriolis force until both forces are balanced and opposite to each other. That's a pretty good option. The pressure gradient force moves the air towards the low pressure, but surface friction starts to pull the air anti-clockwise eventually causing the wind to blow parallel to the ice bars. Nah, not that. Uh, as surface pressure difference starts, air will begin to move towards the low pressure, yes. As the wind gains speed, the pressure gradient force deflection increases to the right until it equals the Coriolis force and now blows perpendicular to the ice bars. No, it blows along the ice bars. An air parcel initially at rest will move from high pressure to low pressure because of the Coriolis force. No, it's because of the pressure gradient force. But as the air moves, it is deflected to the right and eventually balances. So I think it's statement one. Bosh. All right, so let's finish. 80%, that's all right. We can see all questions and answers. Time spent, average per 30 minutes for 30 questions, one minute. That's probably pretty good for time. See the ones that we got wrong, go back, yeah, that. Uh, St. Elmo's fire, it's a discharge. Uh, what hazard can obscure a copy window in flight? I suppose clear ice, yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? Ice forming, southward, I just couldn't get my head around the monsoons today, it would seem. Maybe have worth another look at. Um, haze is a reduction of visibility. No, it's not. That's mist or fog. Haze is to do with smoke. 24, which statement is true for hurricanes? So the Earth's surface, of, yeah, I'd go away and look at some hurricane stuff and tropical revolving storms in general. So there you go. That's how it's done. Um, just do some more um, things like that. You obviously, I have my little notes um, that I took. I would look back over them, see if there's anything that definitely needs more work, such as tropical revolving storms and monsoons. And yeah, hopefully you found something useful out of that. 
this was just a sort of idea that I had um, as a sort of precursor to doing one of the live stream exams, um, kind of for my own benefit as well. So I know that for the live stream exam, I should do a little bit more work on hurricanes and monsoons, just have another look. Um, so hopefully it goes a bit smoother. Um, if you thought this was a good idea, please let me know. Um, if you found it useful, please let me know. And maybe do some more in the future for some other classes and maybe do some halfway through uh, a course, for example, on what we've covered so far, things like that. And yeah, thank you very much. And I'll see you in the next one.